So hi, everybody. Our virtual lecture, third one in the series. One more to go on the 8th, so join us for that one. And that's Historic Homes of uh, Niagara with Linda Fritz. But here we have everybody that we have been waiting wonderfully to hear this one. Women who have, uh, uh, who have uh, uh, broken the glass fort, gone through the glass fort. I think this is going to be such an intriguing one. We can't imagine that. Broke the glass fort is a wonderful suggestion. And we have we have here, we have Elizabeth LeBlanc, we have Erin Ronfield, Julia Kasevic and, and Shana Mercier on phone. So over to you ladies, introduce yourselves a little and we're on. Thank you so much, Babs, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today as myself and my friends and colleagues talk about our experiences breaking through the glass fort and helping to shift and broaden the narrative from history to their or our stories. So as Bab said, my name is Elizabeth LeBlanc and my pronouns are she, her. I am currently the Partnering and Engagement Officer for Parks Canada in Southwestern Ontario and I am privileged to work in the Niagara region today and I'm lucky to have lived and worked from Essex County to Eastern Ontario and the National Capital Region where generations of Indigenous people from Turtle Island have lived on, managed and taken Oh, we've lost her. <laughs> oh no. Are you there, Liz? Oh goodness. Oh, there you are. Good. Okay. I will carry on. Um, we would also like to thank the Niagara on the Lake Museum for inviting us here today and giving us a space for us to talk about our experiences. So am I am I coming through clearly for everyone now? Okay, very good. Uh, so before we get started, um, I'd like to actually introduce uh, my invite my friends to introduce themselves. So, Erin, if you'd like to uh, to kick it off. Uh, sure. So my name is Erin Ronfeld, and my pronouns are she/her. I am the newly appointed manager of Old Fort Erie for the Niagara Parks Commission. Um, but I've spent the last 21 years working at forts and heritage sites. Um, starting off at Fort George National Historic Site. I also worked for some time at the Laura Secord Homestead and the Mackenzie Perentory before ending up in Fort Erie. Um, and Julia. My name is Julia Gersovic. Um, I My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am currently the uh, Acting Communications Officer for Southwestern Ontario uh, with Parks Canada, um, but I started my career at Fort George and I worked uh, there for several years uh, as the Interpretation Coordinator. Um, I was also briefly working at the HMCS Haida um, National Historic Site in Hamilton, uh, as well as Woodside National Historic Site. Um, so, and I have also been associated with the uh, Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, which are those lovely burgundy plaques that you see around. Uh, so I have uh, a lot of familiarity with those as well. And I'll turn it over to Shana. Hello, um, sorry I can't see anybody's faces, but thank you so much for letting me join in today. My name, as mentioned, is Shana Mercy. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the current interpretation coordinator at HMCS Haida National Historic Site in Hamilton. Uh, I've been with Parks Canada for about nine years, uh, and two of those with uh, HMCS Haida. So again, I'd really like to thank everyone for kind of letting me join. I, I do apologize once again for joining in late and causing a little bit of chaos, but wouldn't be me otherwise, I suppose. Thanks so much, Shada. Um, so, I mean, as we all know, women working in cultural heritage isn't necessarily, you know, anything new. Uh, Janet Carnahan was, you know, one of the driving forces, if not the driving force behind the Niagara on the Lake Museum. And that tradition is being carried on today by Sarah, Amy, Babs, and many others. Uh, but not all fields have always been open to women. And sometimes if you did break through, you might be the, you know, virtually the only one there, the only one at the table. So, Today, my colleagues and I are going to talk about our experience as women working in heritage, uh, particularly at our military heritage sites, and how we've worked and continue to work to shift the narrative. So to expand on the stories that we tell at these special places and why that's important. So I'm going to ask Julia to give a little more information and context about what shifting and broadening the narrative actually means. Julia. Thanks, Elizabeth. Now, all heritage sites, whether we realize it or not, 
have a narrative. Uh, these are the stories that we tell and the vantage point from which we tell them. So traditionally, these narratives have been similar to what we would see in the history books, uh, often in the perspective of a white male. And many people today might be familiar with the phrase that history is written by the victor, uh, which is a narrative that excludes a lot of various experiences. It doesn't tell the complete story. So shifting the narrative and broadening it means to include the stories of those that haven't always been presented. It doesn't necessarily mean tossing everything out, uh, but it making, it's making sure that other lenses and perspectives are applied to our heritage site. Um, so Fort Fort George is an example. This means ensuring spaces for stories of the colored core, indigenous warriors, and of course, the women and children uh, who also lived on site and who were also affected by the War of 1812, despite them not being in the military. So these things are not always a quick change and we're not going to be highlighting, um, and we're just going to be highlighting one of the lenses today um, through our experiences as female staff. Um, but I'm going to shout out a piece of legislation and policy, uh, sorry, not legislation, just policy, that can go into more depth about what Parks Canada's framework um, is, and it's called the Parks Canada Framework for History and Commemoration. I'll send a link through the chat in a few moments, um, but this is available online, and it's a guiding document for a lot of our work, um, and I know it's weird to be a fan of, of, of policy, but I highly recommend this as a read if you're interested to see what other projects are being done um, and what other sites might be using. Um, so like I said, we'll try and put that in the chat shortly. But uh, in the spirit of International Women's Day, uh, which is next week on March 8th, we're choosing to discuss shifting the narrative through our female lens. So we may touch upon other lenses as they do often overlap, uh, but please don't take this to mean that they aren't of equal importance just because we don't mention it or that it's not something we're discussing. We're just trying to keep it um, a little bit more contained for ourselves today. Um, so we're going to, to dive into this subject through a series of questions that we'll ask each other. Um, and if anyone has questions for us, feel free to pop them in the chat um, and we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. So to kick off our conversation, I'd like to ask Elizabeth, Erin, and Shana to talk about their work in heritage, what interested them in working in the field, and what their experience as women working in heritage was like. So Elizabeth, do you want to start us off? You need to unmute yourself though, Liz. <laughs> All right, it's always me, it's always me, okay. <laughs> so, um, I had seen the CBC production of Anna Green Gables in grade school and loved it. So when the opportunity came up to volunteer at Fort Malden National Historic Site, um, I could not have been more excited. I mean, I could wear dresses with puffy sleeves. So um, at the time, I primarily worked in the soldier's kitchen, um, which I really enjoyed. And I mean, I can still to this day cook better over an open fire than in a modern kitchen. Um, but at the time, what I really wanted to do was join the artillery crew. And there was this sense of, of camaraderie there amongst the team that I was not a part of. So after a lot of persistence, um, I was eventually trained on the crew and I was the only woman in the historic weapons program for, for quite a number of years. And then that opened the door um, to the rest of Parks Canada's historic weapons program for me. So um, I worked at Parks Canada's national office uh, for a few years and then moved on to my first permanent full-time role at Fort Wellington National Historic Site, where I was responsible for the interpretive programs, the collection and their historic weapons program. So when I went to my first national historic weapons training course, I was one of two women in the room. Um, and the other individual really wasn't involved in the program uh, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. To put that into context, there were about 50 men um, and they were incredibly kind and helped out wherever they could. But I really felt that lack of having another woman to talk to, you know, in that context, um, having someone that I could look to for advice. So, you know, advice on how do you hold a musket properly when your shoulders are too narrow to tuck the stock into? Um, how do you deal with being a safety officer at reenactments um, and having them call you sweetie and little lady all the time um, and then completely disregard what you're saying? Um, you know, when I'm dressed as a soldier, should I try to look and behave in as masculine a way as, I, as, as possible? You know, where is that line? So, you know, a few years later, though, I was a junior instructor on that same course 
and I'm grateful that I've been able to be that resource person now for other staff members for almost 20 years. And I absolutely love it. So that's that's me, my experience in a nutshell. Um, Erin, would you like to, to go next? Um, sure. So what got me started in Heritage um, was maybe a, a little less history love uh, is what Liz had. Um, mine was I was really looking for a fun summer job. Uh, at the time I was in high school and all of my friends were applying to Fort George. So I thought, hey, I'm going to apply to work a summer job with my friends. Now, those of us that actually got the position, all of my female friends were kind of put in more of an interpretive role uh, where they got to dress like women and talk to the public. But I think it came across in my interview, I was extremely shy. So I was very grateful that I did not get placed in that role. And instead I kind of got to focus on drill. It wasn't so much speaking with the public, um, but I had to dress as a soldier. Um, at this time, this was only the second year that Fort George was really allowing women to dress as soldiers. Uh, and really Fort George was one of the first forts in Ontario to actually allow this to happen. So it was a relatively new program. And there were a couple other women that were with me in the animation squad, um, some of whom had been there the very first year. Uh, however, um, much like Liz experienced it, you don't really have necessarily people that you can go to sometimes to help you. I'm a bit of a curvier person, so I struggled with some things with the muskets, with the guns, with the motions, and it was kind of hard to, to get tips about how to perhaps do something that would work for me and my body. Um, and to be honest, I was uh, quite an awful soldier when I first started out. I mean, it, it's not something that comes natural to all of us. And I think that gave me this drive to keep going back every summer so that I could improve. And when I start to see that improvement, even though all my other friends had kind of gone off to other jobs, I kept coming back for about another 18 years, <laughs> whether they liked it or not, um, just because I loved the history and the drill so much. So that's kind of how I got my start. Um, Julia, if you'd like to speak about yours. Yeah, so uh, I applied for a summer job at Fort George in 2012 um, because, quite frankly, it, it paid better than most of the classic uh, Niagara Falls tourist jobs, uh, and I thought it would be fun. Um, I was in school for psychology, social work, and law, so I never started at the Fort thinking it would be a career for me. Um, and I used to joke that I just liked talking to people and I didn't really care about what. Um, I liked history, I found it interesting. So, and I was like, what a fun summer job to dress up. Um, so I, I kind of jumped in with both feet. Um, and then as I started working uh, in the field, I uh, used to, uh, I found that people that were talking to me were the people who were um, kind of generally being dragged to the site by their history loving uh, person or family member. Um, and so, I was that safe person for them uh, to talk to on site. So I wasn't dressed in military uniforms. I wasn't gonna force history down their throat because I didn't really care what we were talking about. I was just happy to chat. Um, and so I kind of became, almost, I don't know what it was, if I had like a beacon or, or whatever on me, uh, but it, it kind of helped attract those people. And I really learned to love that and, and kind of thrive on it. Um, and since, these visitors didn't want to talk history in the traditional way. Um, the satisfaction for me of finding those connection points with visitors um, to still connect our stories um, of what, why our heritage places are important has really kept me here. Um, so I started in 2012, which I also joke is the year that mattered for the bicentennial at Fort George. Um, and I, and uh, I, I'm still associated to the site uh, 11 something years later. So. Uh, that's kind of mine, and I did take a, a few turns um, to other heritage sites um, where, again, I just really love trying to connect with people uh, in all of our places. So, Shana, welcome visually, uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to you now uh, to talk a bit about your how you got started in heritage. Hello, yeah, um, felt like forever trying to get here, but I'm finally glad that I can actually see everybody's faces. Uh, yeah, for me, it really is um, almost a tale as old as time. I turned 16. My parents said, time for you to go get a job, lady. And I said, 
will do. Um, and I do recall, you know, constantly going to go pick up my brother when he was working at the fort a couple of years previously. And he was telling me like all of these super amazing experiences that he got to have, just how cool the job was in general. And I mean, as you mentioned, Julia, obviously the pay was something something hard to turn down so I applied um funny enough uh when I went through to the interview process Erin was actually the one sat across the table from me and that was my first experience with her little did she know she would be spending so many years with me working one way or another together and uh, I truly am very grateful um for the chance that you did take on me just wanted to put that plug in there for you um but yeah I I'd like to say, I guess, that the rest is history, but that's what we're here to talk about today. So um, I really just, I've been very lucky that I've been afforded the opportunity to be a part of many different parts of the team um, at Fort George. I've done a whole bunch of different stuff, such as um, working as the visitor reception. So welcoming all the folks into the site, telling them which way to go, being part of the squad, that was a huge, huge thing for me and it's led to a lot of really great experiences that I I don't think that a 16 year old me or even now 25 year old me could have ever envisioned having so I'm pretty I recognize that I'm very lucky that um, a lot of the groundwork that Aaron, Julia um, and Liz have all really laid down for me was already done and it's just really an honor to be here today so thank you so much um, I think that's it Okay, thanks, Gina. Um, so I am going to toss this kind of first question over to Aaron first. So um, I would like to know why you care about shifting the narrative. So at what point in your career did, you know, the idea of shifting the narrative become important to you? Yeah, so <clears throat> at least for me, it wasn't like there was a light bulb moment where it was like, oh, we need to start telling more inclusive stories. Uh, I think it kind of comes through over time as you kind of work your way through the ranks at Fort George, you're given a bit more time and encouragement to do research projects on your own. And when I was doing some research projects and I started to hear and come across these stories of kind of women who played bigger roles than just a soldier's wife on a date, who also had an important role, but some of these more interesting like heroine stories and I got very passionate about the information and I think as all historic interpreters do when we're reading a book or information that we are really excited about we just want to start telling that story to the public because we want to pass that pass that excitement on to them so for me it was kind of educating myself hearing these interesting stories that were above and beyond the daily talk of kind of what soldiers did that just made me kind of want to shift that narrative and start telling these different stories because I thought they were interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Shana wants to add on. You need to unmute yourself though, Shana, <laughs> if you want to add. <laughs> See, not just you, Liz. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to make sure you felt like there was someone else in the world doing the same thing. Um, yeah, uh, I think, as with everybody, everyone's experiences were different. And I actually do have like a very vivid memory um, of one day working in one of the buildings with the rest of the squad being sat down. And this one uh, person comes up and he goes, like, doesn't really say hello, just sat down. The gentleman goes, you wouldn't have been here. And then just has other um, comments that weren't necessarily very um, welcoming or maybe as open as maybe we would like to have as terms of a conversation. Um, there were, you know, a few things that weren't necessarily very comfortable to talk about, but it was in that moment in time where I saw just like the ability that I could, or the role that I guess I could play within that in doing my own dil diligence in looking through all of this history that we know, where can I step up and be like, well, actually that's not, not to be like, well, I'm um, actually, that's not true, but just give that chance to actually educate and be like, there are so many other stories that we could be sharing such as X, Y, Z. And here are some stuff. If you're very interested in history, please go take this, go to the gift shop, go find a book and like read up on it. Cause there are so many amazing things that are kind of being left out of the discussion, if you will, just due to the fact that it's easier, I guess, potentially, we don't know anything like that, but 
or I guess I don't really know because I'm not a historian exactly, but I think it was really just like that moment in time where I was like, whoa, okay. So if we're thinking that it's only one type of person, like there's so many people sat here today, there's that, that that's there's no way there has to be more. And that's kind of what kickstarted that passion for me and trying to learn a little bit more so that I can share with other folks. And hopefully as Ron, uh, Aaron had said, share that passion with others so that they also can become impassionated as well. Um, you know, uh, the stories that we tell visitors um, as holders of historical knowledge do help us to shape the scope of understanding whether good or bad, right? So it's on um, the role of everyone to kind of learn, I believe, and to share those cultural, ecological, communal, et cetera, whatever amazing stories we'd like to share um, in the correct way, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, I also have a, another vivid memory of going to Fort Niagara for the first time and reading the Betsy Doyle story and being like, whoa, there's a whole other story about this cool woman who did something that wasn't just walking through a forest, like no shade, Laura Secord, but I, there's more to it. And I think that's really what kind of got me super excited and kind of wanting to learn more and keep pushing myself. And thankfully it's gotten to be where I am today. Um, so uh, Elizabeth, I'm sure you would like to add a little something to that as well. Honestly, I, I mean, I think the what you and Aaron both said was, you know, it was very spot on. It wasn't a light bulb moment for me in particular. Um, it was more coming to the realization that not everyone can relate to that very specific experience of, you know, the British soldier um, and that not all visitors may you know, may also have super fond memories of, of the army or of the British army, depending where they've, you know, come to, to Canada from, where they're visiting us from. Um, but what I learned through my experience in the cookhouse um, is that everybody eats. So that it doesn't matter, you know, doesn't matter where you're from, where you're from, what language you speak, um, everyone can connect with food. And, you know, or, or even when you look at the, uh, the music program at Fort George and Fort Malden, you know, it's another, it's another experience that transcends, you know, beyond words. And it, uh, you know, it really kind of started that, that way of thinking of how, you know, rather than, you know, inadvertently excluding, how do we, you know, tell stories that are as diverse as the people that walk through our gates? So um, that would be kind of probably my my 20 year long moment. <laughs> Very so lovely. Yeah. yeah, um, so I was just wondering, um, why could shifting the narrative be important to the public and the kinds of experiences that we offer at our places? Um, Julie, did you, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I think it's like a bit of what Elizabeth was saying that, um, being able to connect with someone um, and for everyone to be able to see themselves um, so that they can connect and it becomes that much more personally meaningful to them. Um, it makes all of these places so much more accessible um, and not just physically because unfortunately a lot of times historic sites aren't but having that emotional connection really makes you um, want to to know more and to learn all of the sides. So um, yeah, okay, I've learned one perspective, but now being able to see kind of how I may have fit in if I was here historically or um, knowing that as well, it provides more options, not just for that one perspective, like we're not sharing the female perspective just so that you can, it's just for women, it's so that you can compare and contrast as well. So uh, knowing how, what their rations were compared to the soldier, gives you a sense of comparison of, oh, that we thought the soldier had, didn't have a lot and then the female had even less. So that's, those also kind of helps ex expand the stories and put them into a context that makes more sense. Um, and so that everyone benefits from that, not just the people who may look like that or may identify a certain way. Um, so that's where I think it's really important to be able to shift it. And then because we do have a, a lot of neat programs like our cooking programs and like our music programs that really add value to all of our places and, and Fort George wouldn't be the same without them, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so that's where with those things being able to add it, they're helping everyone, uh, but they are also adding these stories um, that shift the narrative just away from, from one specific point of view. Um, so it's kind of neat to see it that way. Now, um, I don't know if anyone else has anything uh, to add. Elizabeth, maybe you do. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just add that as Julia was saying that, you know, there were women here 
you know, and they weren't just working in the kitchen or in the garden. Um, there were indigenous people, black people, people of color, um, people from the two SLGBTQIA plus communities. You know, how do we make sure that their stories are included? And I mean, that that falls to us to, to do that research and try to bring those stories out into the light. Um, and make sure that our visitors have, you know, so many different points that they have the opportunity to connect with, rather than just, you know, sort of the one dominant narrative, which we've we've had for a lot of years. And as I mentioned previously, you know, like I really strongly feel that our stories should be as diverse as the visitors that come through our gates. That is an excellent way of putting it and what we all strive towards, I think. Um, now, are there any moments or projects that anyone feels particularly proud of um, or that you think are a good example of shifting the narrative? And Erin, I'll let you start us off on this one. Sure. So um, I think that a lot of the projects that we try to take on and work on are maybe a bit more uh, female driven because that is something we're passionate about. So I have written a few different presentations and talks. Um, what I'm particularly proud of is called Beyond C Chord. I know we tend to pick on her a lot. It's, it's nothing against her. She's definitely done something incredible and amazing. We all acknowledge that. It's just her story is much more well known. It's well told. It's well represented compared to some of these other female heroines that perhaps uh, don't get that recognition, even though they also did something quite amazing. Uh, women like Mary Henry, Elizabeth Stewart, and as... Um, Shana mentioned Fanny Doyle from Fort Niagara. So it, it's uh, a talk where I get to kind of dive into a little bit more educating people that women weren't just in kitchens, women weren't just in the garden. Those in fact were jobs done by men and soldiers too inside of a fort. It wasn't a sole task for women. So there were other outstanding moments. And unfortunately, they're not as well uh, noted or written about because as Julia mentioned early on, often the victor's voice, right? So the men's voice. And a lot of the time, these women, they were so busy running households, they didn't have time to write, you know, the story of, hey, I walked into a battlefield today and uh, gave some water to some soldiers. Uh, it's, it's not a story that uh, is well told. told. So I uh, am very proud of being able to dive in and, and try to tell those stories. Um, but I know Fort George has done a lot. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, anyone else has something else to add. Shana, perhaps? Yeah. Um, for me, one huge moment that I was like super proud of, of seeing that shift happen was coming in when I did. Um, number one, coming in when you were there as a sergeant was something that led me to kind of see this is something that I could do as well if this is something that I really love and I mean obviously I loved it I stayed there for a very long time um and I kind of used that and uh, that passion and drive that you had and said well if Liz LeBlanc can do it if Julie Grisper can do it if Ron Paul can, or Ron Paul can do it as well like that means that there's a space for me and space for people to come behind me as well and like hopefully just like pop my elbows out a little bit more so that the um, folks behind me can or who are coming up next also have a welcoming space um, a particular project um, that I have heard of that I, I'm going to pass it off to Julia because I, I know she can speak much more uh, fondly about it than I can, um, was actually created by a fellow interpreter named Fred. So I'll pass it off to her if she'd like to speak a little bit about that. Yeah, and I, I always find that this is a good example. And I think Fred's in the chat. So thanks, Fred, for, for this one. I don't know if you know this yourself, but um, uh, during 2020, when we were shifting to, to do new um, types of work and our student staff um, and our GT staff got uh, a little bit more time than they might to do some research projects um, at Fort George. Um, and I kind of gave everyone some freedom to pick a topic that uh, was of interest to them. And Fred actually came to me um, and said, you know, I've been working in the squad. I watch people go ask my female coworkers about 
whether or not they would have been there. And I don't want to burden them with having to answer that question repeatedly. I want to be able to help answer them. And so he told me uh, that. And so then he developed a talk about women in the army, uh, women who had snuck into the army um, and kind of those who had presented themselves as male to in order to accomplish different things. So um, he approached, approached it so purposely um, and so meaningfully. Um, and he really had this venue and if you happened to come last October to the site you may have heard him deliver that talk um, and it was just a moment for me of that of a, a purposeful allyship that it's not just us who are doing it um, and it was just slightly different from topics that we had had before and it really filled a void that it was an interesting topic and it's a great talk if you ever do get a, listen, a chance to listen to him deliver that um, no pressure, Fred, <laughs> on that one. Uh, but these are, are stories that need to be shared, and it's not just us who are doing them um, on that one. So. Well, and I think it's amazing, too, and I think it needs to be acknowledged that people like Julia created an environment where Fred felt comfortable approaching you and making that ask and, you know, helping him find, you know, kind of the way, the, the way to frame it, or, you know, just, just providing with an opportunity to be able to, uh, to do that and to be an ally is, uh, is amazing. And it's something that I see in Aaron and Shana as well. So I love it. And I can't wait to hear some of these products when we go visit, <laughs> visit our sites in, in coming years. Uh, for myself, um, kind of a, a moment that I, was thinking of last night um, was during the the bicentennial of the war of 1812 and I was asked to narrate the 200th anniversary of the battle of Queenston Heights in front of a crowd of thousands and needless to say I did not get much sleep the night before I was <laughs> wildly nervous um, but I deliberately tried to incorporate other stories into the narration beyond what was happening on the battlefield before us. Um, you know, what was happening in the local communities? How is this impacting First Nations people and women and children? And what role did the Color Corps play? You know, you looked out at the diversity of the audience and you knew you had to make this relevant for them. So, and just that feeling of afterwards when I had members of the public, staff, volunteers, um, our CEO and his wife who were sitting directly behind me throughout it, um, which did not add any pressure at all, um, but also reenactors coming up, some of whom 20 years previously, you know, when I would approach them at, a, at an event to, to talk about weapons expansion, you know, in, inspections or so on would, you know, say, now little lady, I've been doing this longer than you've been alive you know, to have those same people coming up and telling me how nice it was to have a different voice, bringing different elements to the narration um, than they had heard previously. Uh, you know, like that was really, that was like, gave me all the good, all the good feelings inside. And, uh, and it's something that I really credit Parks Canada and Niagara Parks with giving me the opportunity to do that. So a huge shout out to, uh, to both of those organizations. Now, I would like to know, um, and maybe Julia and Shana, you might want to sort of take this first one. Do you see that change is happening? Yeah, I, I do. And, and I think it's something that um, we've definitely uh, been able to see that there's more stories coming out um, from across uh, different lenses and different perspectives, depending on what people are passionate about. Um, and so it is also something that uh, a credit to, to our whole, all of our teams that they're supportive of us doing it. It's not like we're out one man band, like elbows out trying to make these happen all the time. Uh, no, other people like these stories as well. We have the support from the organizations to do it. Um, and um, I, and I thank you for saying that I helped create this space because I'm just following in your footsteps. Um, but uh, they are, um, like for Shana, for example, uh, this past year was able to do um, a, a talk on one of her passions, uh, which is Indigenous representation. And she did that on Truth and Reconciliation Day at Fort George on September 30th. Um, and she helped bring this perspective and, and we weren't trying to publicly um, 
promote that event, but we really wanted those stories to be told on such an important day. And it was because of Shana that um, that, that managed to happen because of her passions. Um, and so we have this freedom to tell more stories and we have a platform to do it and, and people are doing it. And so that's the change that I'm seeing. And it's not just people from the marginalized communities that are doing it. It's all of the allies on site as well, someone like Fred. Um, and Shana, I, I don't know if you have anything more to add. I know you that was your passion project and I really wanted to shout you out on that one because it was so well done and it inspired me to, to learn more at the time. Yeah, thank, thank you for saying such kind words. Uh, you were also a big help in that, I don't think you remember. Um, but I think one thing that I really wanted to add just to what you were saying was, I, I vividly do remember standing outside. We had um, just stood outside for a little while just to talk to anybody who was kind of, oh, what's going on? What are you guys doing? All that stuff. And it did not matter where everyone was coming from. We had folks coming from all over and they were all super interested and engaged with us in these wonderful conversations that I truthfully don't think that we would have really seen in that space. I, for sure when I started and maybe even up to a couple of years ago. So I think that really speaks to just how far everyone's been willing to kind of let themselves grow and learn in all of these different avenues. Because yes, as we've been saying that today, is we are focusing on women, but I there are so many other conversations that I, I think are being had and are continuing to be had and even new topics that maybe weren't even thought of a couple of years ago that now we're, we have the ability to do the research and we're thankfully being given the time by these ag the agency that we work for to sit down, like really get to know all of these wonderful stories that, so that we can present and hopefully make people feel a little more welcome to these sites that maybe they didn't necessarily feel welcome to in previous years because their stories weren't being shared or because they couldn't see themselves you know in the the squad that we were all standing next to or in the kitchen or in the officers quarters you name it any of those spaces on site and I, I hope that that is also transitioning to all of the other national historic sites uh, I personally can't speak to Fort Malden but I know Liz you have a really great connection with them and I'm sure that they've been doing really amazing things as well um, I also really wanted to add that I was lucky enough to be part of the squad in two different ways one um was all of the groundwork that had been laid by these wonderful people that I'm sat here next to today, sat here next to today, but also they helped me want to create a space for folks that was welcome, as welcoming and inviting and as understanding and listening, like the ability just to sit down and listen. And I think that is what led to my second favorite part of being part of the squad, which was helping to create a space where we actually had the most, the largest contingent of females within the squad that they had ever seen and still have to this day, to a point where it was like, it was actually 50-50. And that was a really wonderful experience to see that like, you know, they were coming in when women were only just starting to be allowed to work at these forts. And within such a small time, we've really kind of just let that guard down of, well, women weren't in the army, so they can't be a part of the army. And it's really thanks to them that I've, I've been given, obviously, all of these amazing opportunities, but that I can kind of step back and really just enjoy myself and hopefully other folks get to enjoy themselves and see themselves. Yeah, it's really um, nice to be able to, uh, to, to, to not just see the change in allyship from our peers, but also from the visitors and, and, and the reception that we're getting. Yeah. Uh, from that, both visibly and and in conversation um, on that one. And um, so recognizing that change doesn't happen overnight. Is there something that your predecessor did for you uh, that made your life easier? Um, and is there something that you're trying to do for your successors? So Shana, since you're kind of the, the, the most um, junior of us in, the, in this chain of command here, um, why don't you start us off here? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as I was alluding to in the last little section, um, I have the I've been blessed with that ability to walk in and have all of these things done for me, or maybe not done, but like that path had already been laid out for me, and I could understand and know where my space was and who, what path I could take to find folks that I could confide in and find information to help create a more kind of welcoming space. Um, and when I left Fort George my main focus was really how do I ensure that these steps that have been taken by those before me can still be 
are still there. They're still known. You can still see them, I guess, um, because we do unfortunately sometimes go through very large turnover um, in staff, especially in the squad. You know, we you're only a student for so long. Um, so how do you ensure that these steps that have been taken don't just disappear and kind of start from square one again um, was really something that I I tried to focus on. And obviously, unfortunately, I'm not there anymore, but I have heard that it is still going strong and some folks are still feeling very welcomed. Um, I also, obviously, as I mentioned, everyone on this panel that has sat with me has paved the way. Um, and I really tried to continue to foster and nourish an environment where anyone can come and feel comfortable, welcome, heard, and seen, whether that's from the information that we share I share with the public or within uh, all of the folks that I work with, um, not only at Fort George, but also at HMCS Haida. Um, Julia, I'll pass it back to you if you'd like to touch on that since you've been to both sites, you're kind of the bridge between, if you will. Yeah, and I, I've had the privilege of, of working with all of these wonderful women as well. And um, and I know I shared some of those that same sentiments as, as Shana of, I wanna make sure that if I move on, it's, it's there's, I'm not going to just create a gap that's not going to be filled by someone who looks like me um, or who who has some of the same challenges as me. But that's not always necessary. And I, and I think it's because the people who came before me uh, that were Erin and Elizabeth and Elizabeth actually hired me. So shout out to her uh, for picking good people. <laughs> um, but uh, I felt like their what they were doing in the in their roles and their purposes were they were really um, making space for for me um, and so they listened to the, the experience of those under them whether they were other female staff or other male staff like whatever anyone was presenting as they always listened um, for, to those experiences and then used that experience that they were listening to and questioned people around them um, so whether it was people above them and so it wasn't always like a why are we doing it this way? I don't think it was ever like that <laughs> realistically, uh, but it was just, they were priming that need for change uh, so that when I did come in and, and asked like, hey, why are we doing it this way? Why aren't we doing it that way? People were kind of ready to be like, yeah, you're right. Why are we doing it that way? Um, because it, it's not always a fight to get change done. Um, and so when, and sometimes there was a, a space that they created and then people looked to me to be like, how do we fill it? And I, all I got the fun of being like, well, why don't we try this? Or why don't we try that? Um, so they, uh, the people before me were really my biggest allies and mentors and they were cheering me on and they stayed invested in what we were doing even after they themselves moved on from the site. And so that gave me an opportunity to learn from the best. Um, and so I tried to, to replicate that for those um, following me because it, it's really that joint efforts that really kind of makes things done and it made it easier for me. Erin, as the person who supervised me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Shana and Julia give us uh, maybe a little too much credit sometimes for <laughs> bursting through these walls and barriers, but I think because a large part of what the drive is for senior, more senior people like me and Elizabeth is having people worth breaking those walls down for. If it was just us working alone, you you kind of stay a little more quiet. You don't have that reason to to speak out or speak against doing things a certain way. But when we started to see people like Julia and Shana who were very passionate and good at what they did, we kind of wanted to try to, I think, make a bit more space because we knew the quality that was coming up behind us. So I, I think that really we needed to have a team of women to make our voices uh, a bit stronger and heard and, and give us a reason to kind of keep pushing forward. I'm not sure if Elizabeth has anything to add. Um, I think I'll, I'll just second what you, you said, Erin, that working with a group of people like this, um, you know, a group of incredible women, that inspires me to keep working and to keep pushing and to keep asking questions and to keep learning. There is so much to learn. Um, and I have been so fortunate to work with amazing teams um, at our places, uh, from Fort Malden to, you know, Fort George to Fort Wellington to our national office. And then, you know, our network of places all across the country and also the partners that we work with. Um, you know, I mean, it's been just an absolutely amazing experience and it's what drives me to kind of keep doing, see, see what else we can do, what more, what, what other stories can we tell? Um, 
And, you know, I think as Shana was mentioning, I think we do need to be diligent and make sure that we continue to work together to offer an environment where all of our staff, our visitors, our volunteers, that everyone is comfortable, supported, and encouraged. And I think that kind of leads to our next question, which is kind of where do we see the narrative going and what do we hope to see kind of happen next? Um, Julia? Yeah, and hopefully the work we've done in shifting the narrative so far continues regardless of gender, uh, regardless of, of um, whatever aspect or lens we're talking about, because we started creating a culture of allyship of people that will continue this work. And so whether it's someone like Fred or someone uh, else that comes in af after he moves on, because he's a very bright young man and he probably will uh, find some really smart job that outshines me. Um, but um, there is this kind of allyship that's been created. And, and so people will continue this work and not just because it's the right thing to do, but because they know the value of it. And even if it's not us there, that someone that looks like this will still be there in a role working or that if not, they want to make a safe space for someone else who doesn't look like them. Um, I think a lot of people are seeing the value in, in diversifying and and making sure that if, if we're not a diverse team, then how do we looking at ourselves and making sure that we're we're being a safe space for that. And so I think we've already started that and, uh, and hopefully that kind of continues in creating that that safe space. Elizabeth, do you have anything? Yeah, and like Julie was saying, I mean, I would just like to continue to see more women, you know, more Black people, more people of colour, more Indigenous people, people from the 2S LGBTQIA plus communities, people with different abilities joining the heritage communities, because it's, that is the only way that we're going to tell more fulsome stories. Um, you know, together, if we work together, we can re weave this incredibly rich tapestry of experience for the peoples of Canada and for visitors from all over the world that come to our places. And, you know, we can just continue to work to find more ways to engage more people, to really be truly, truly inclusive. So Shana, um, did you want to ask the, uh, did you want to bring us through the last question? Yeah, I'd love to continue to weave in this conversation. <laughs> um, more specifically, just any advice that any of uh, we might, any advice that we might have um, specifically to uh, any young folks that would are thinking of potentially joining in the heritage um, industry, whether that's military or any. Um, it, would you actually like to start us off, Liz? Sure, sure. Am I on mute? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, so I just, I find it amazing to look kind of at the four of us that we all started from a very similar point. You know, we all started as students. And uh, to me, the heritage field is just, it's absolutely amazing. And it is so full of opportunities. I would really advise anyone that's interested, um, and particularly, you know, a, a young person, to reach out to organizations that interest you, to see if you can speak with someone about what opportunities there are and what different fields there are to work in. See if you can volunteer or get a summer job there. Um, you will be amazed at the diversity of career opportunities that are available. Um, and it was interesting during a seminar last year led by our values, ethics, diversity and inclusion team, um, they said that women make up over 50% of public service employees, which I was kind of surprised at, but that we, amongst many other groups, um, are still underrepresented in senior management and trades and in executive roles. So, um, you know, look at how you can make your mark, you know, how you can come into these organizations, how can you make it better for the people around you, how can you make it better for the next folks that are going to be following, you know, behind you. Um, and I, I mean, I look at the Niagara on the Lake Museum, I look at Sarah and Amy and Babs and, you know, all of these other women that are working in leadership roles and heritage as well. So, I mean, it's, it's not something that only has to happen, you know, within government either. So many opportunities out there. Um, you know, don't exclude yourself or talk yourself out of going for something. So I don't know if anyone has anything that they'd like to add on to that. I might pop in and add um, that 
a lot of the times that we're not trying to be an expert, we're just trying to get the story together, which is actually a quote uh, from Heather George, um, who is a wonderful researcher uh, in the heritage community. And she said that, and it really stuck with me as if it's interesting to you, don't don't hesitate to, to, to follow it. Um, because if you don't see anyone who looks like you, you might be the, the one to for someone else kind of thing. So, um, and you have a, a resource of people like us who are going to be there to cheer you on and to support you how we can as well um, on that one. So I just thought I'd add that in there for ourselves. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's what I've got. So I'll pass it back to you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Erin or Shana, did you have any last sort of thoughts before um... I pass this back over to Babs to see if anyone has submitted any questions in the uh, in the chat. Uh, I just I really second what Liz says. It's it's kind of amazing to see how we've all started off relatively in the same shoes, um, and like just diverse how far we've come, uh, and how many different roles we've all kind of slotted into. <laughs> Uh, you can see how our interests have kind of pulled us in maybe a little different directions. Um, and if anyone's interested in, in joining the heritage team, um, I know us at Niagara Parks and Heritage, we're hiring. I'm sure Parks Canada is always looking for students as well. Um, so yeah, get on, get online, apply. If that's something that interests you, we're always really happy to take on anyone who's interested. You don't need to know history to work in history. All of us sitting here at this table have varying degrees in the wildest of subject matter that don't really cover history. Um, so it, it's not really necessary to have a passion to speak to the public and just to research things and, and get the story across and get the story out there. So you don't need to have a history background at all. If it's something you're passionate about, you can always look online if, if it's not for work, if you just want to volunteer part time, I know COVID kind of killed a lot of volunteer programs, but they're starting to come back out now. And a lot of museums, we really depend on our volunteers to keep us moving forward. So if that's something you're interested in, you have a bit of spare time, please continue to look or reach out. I know Elizabeth has shared her email address in the chat. I will share mine as well. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions about that. So inspiring hearing what you've said, ladies. It's really, and um, there's a couple of comments coming in the Q&A reiterating that. Heather Arnott, for example, has said that uh, she's now the new curator, by the way, of the Niagara Apothecary, and she's going to be presenting and interpreting, interpreting the historically male-dominated profession and business. Another good moment. And, and Janice says that uh, uh, it's for her career in agriculture, shift into a living history and agriculture now with the, the breaking down those barriers and happy to see that women are fairly common in living history agriculture narratives as well. So I think you answered so many of the questions. I was scribbling down questions and each time I scribbled down the question, you basically answered it because there were questions I wanted to know about how do you, how do you keep women in the senior roles? How do you keep women in senior management roles? And all of you are doing that. And I look at your faces and we're all of us are rather white faces here and how you've managed to say, yes, we can include and make this a more diverse environment. And really, I think those stories will in, include more people, make them want to join your wonderful world, our world telling the stories. How do we not have little boys just want to play with guns and girls would pick them up. And you said making them available for a female body, even interesting to me that you can, uh, when working in historic weaponry, I found that was a fascinating comment. So lots of things you brought up. How do you make this, how do you, how we tell our stories we come to International Women's Day in March. This is really, really, I think, pointing out that we have a strong, strong women in our community that are making this really important. And um, just see if there's any other chat things that are coming up. You're putting your names in there, person. Thank you, thank you. And we're right on the edge of our clock here. So I think that it's just been a perfect uh, set of International Women's Month and Day. And you have totally shown us how we can all break through fort ceilings, glass ceilings. And I, I encourage you heartily to keep working through, keep climbing up and yeah, you've just been a wonderful inspiration to us all. Thank you so much. And everybody, for our viewers, stay tuned. We've got one more, one more virtual 
lecture coming up on March the 